this has become about giving gifts and receiving gifts. It hasn't always been that way. And then Easter has become about bunnies and candy. It hasn't always been that way. Uh, but, you know, we wouldn't celebrate Easter if it weren't for Christmas. Uh, if it weren't for the resurrection, okay, so a baby was born and the guy died. Um, and we wouldn't celebrate Easter because we wouldn't know about it without Pentecost, which is what we're celebrating today. So it's the third biggest celebration. Um, and, uh, and, and so as we begin, I want to invite you to stand up. You're going to notice a lot of Holy Spirit uh, hymns and uh, our readings are going to, and, and sermon are going to kind of talk about Pentecost and what that is. As we begin, I want to invite you to stand up, greet the people around you, and then stay standing for our first hymn, uh, which is a Holy Spirit hymn. <laughs> Holy Spirit, light divine. confession and forgiveness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear friends, we gather as the first believers did to pray for God's Spirit and anticipate His work. Just as they did, we recognize that our lack of holiness would disqualify us from being God's servant and vessels for the Holy Spirit if it were not for the righteousness of Christ, by which we are forgiven and made new. So we prepare our hearts for the work of God by confessing our failures, repenting our sins, and receiving his forgiving grace. So now we pause to silently consider our sins and ask for forgiveness. Let us confess our sins to God. Holy, Holy Father, Father, we confess that we have not been holy as you are holy. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and action by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole hearts, nor have we loved others as you love us. Yet you sent your Son to redeem us, and you sent your Spirit to give us new lives. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in you, 
and serve you with joy. Hear the good news. Through Jesus' righteousness, righteous death in our place, we are forgiven and set free from sin. And the Holy Spirit enable us to, to live bold and joyful lives as God's representatives on earth. Amen. And now the prayer of the day. Almighty God, thank you for keeping your promise to forgive us and to pour out your spirit so that we can all be your witnesses. Refresh us with this gift and guide us in all we do and say so that others will come to God with grace and joy in which we live. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you, the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. <coughs> I want to invite uh, Craig and Terry and Hunter and Silver to come forward and meet you. I'm always glad when people are happy to meet you. Dear friends, you have already come to faith and become members of this family of God as you heard his word and were baptized in his name. Now by joining together as members of this local faith family, you are publicly acknowledging your commitment to remain in Christ and his church, particularly through the confession of the Lutheran Church and the mission of this congregation to reach the lost and strengthen the saved through the power of the Holy Spirit. I therefore ask you now in the presence of God and this congregation, do you accept and confess that the teachings of the Lutheran Church, as you've learned to know them, are faithful and true to the Word of God? If so, answer, I do. Yes, I do. As members of this congregation, do you intend to continue in the confession of the Church, participate regularly in worship, make frequent use of, of the forgiveness found in communion, continue to study the Word of God, and lead a righteous life to the best of your ability? If so, answer, I do so intend with the help of God. I do so intend. We support the work our gracious Lord has given this congregation with your prayers, time, treasure, and talent. Will you be devoted to one another in brotherly love and honor one another above yourselves, speaking the truth in love, building one another up, resisting gossip, defending one another's reputations, and confronting one another, as well as congregational leaders in person when offended, making every effort to be reconciled and live at peace with one another? If so, answer... I will with the help of God. Upon this your promise, I in the name of this congregation extend to you the right hand of fellowship and love, acknowledging you as members of this congregation and the Lutheran Church. I invite you to receive the Lord's Supper and participate in all the other blessings of salvation which God has given to his church in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So welcome, you guys. You want to shake my hand? No. <laughs> Let's welcome Craig and Terry. And we want to uh, continue on uh, responding to God's gifts by singing a, a song that talks about the Holy Trinity and features the role of the Holy Spirit. There is a redeemer.
So Moses went out and told the people what the Lord had said. He brought together 70 of his elders and, then, and had them stand around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke with him, and he took up the spirit that was on him and put the spirit on the 70 elders. When the spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but they did not do so again. However, two men whose names were Iladad and Medad had remained in the camp. They were listed among the elders, but did not go out to the tent. Yet the Spirit also rested on them, and they prop prophesied in the camp. A young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. Joshua, son of Nun, who had been Moses' aide since youth, spoke up and said, Moses, my lord, stop them. But Moses replied, are you jealous for my sake? I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. Then Moses and the elders of, the Israel, of Israel returned to the camp. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The responsive reading is from Psalm 25, verses 1 through 15. In our psalm, we join King David in expressing confidence in God's grace and asking for his guidance so that we may be faithful to him. In you, Lord my God, I put my trust. I trust in you. Do not let me be put to shame. Not let my enemies triumph over me. No one who hopes in you will ever be put to shame. But shame will come on those who are treacherous without cause. Show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me. For you are God my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. Remember, Lord, your great mercy and love. For they are from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember, for you, Lord, are good. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in his ways. He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them in his way. All the ways of the Lord are loving and faithful. Toward those who keep the demands of his covenant. For the sake of your name, Lord. Forgive my iniquity, iniquity, though it is great. Who then are those who fear the Lord? He will struck, instruct them in the ways they should choose. They will spend their days in prosperity. And their descendants will inherit the land. The Lord confides in those who fear him. He makes his covenant known to them. My eyes are ever on the Lord, for he will release my feet from the snare. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, and is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The epistle reading is from Acts chapter 2. On Pentecost, Moses gets his wish, and the prophecy is fulfilled. 
the Holy Spirit is poured out on all believers, amazing everyone in Jerusalem. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, Are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Corinthians, Medes, the Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phygra, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, What does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, They've had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what is spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my Holy Spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We want to respond to that word and also prepare our hearts for what's to come by singing together Spirit of the Living God.
inside this thing. Do you think I could get inside it? Even part of me, like my little finger, if I shoved really hard? No? So there's no part of me that can get in this thing. What about my breath? I can put breath in it. Today, I'm going to be talking about the Holy Spirit. And the word spirit means breath both in the old part of the Bible and the newer part of the Bible, which is still old by our standards. But the Holy Spirit means the, the breath of God. It's the part of God that can be inside us, which is kind of mysterious. But here's the thing. When the Holy Spirit is in us, it gives us a lot of energy. Right? It, it, and that's why it's important. The Holy Spirit has a lot of things it does to help us. And that's why I brought this thing. And I'm going to give you guys a, a couple of these to go back and and they, they're not the kind who make noise. I'd be impressed if you could, but uh, but you guys can take these with us. So uh, I just wanted to introduce the sermon that way. Let's pray together, and I'll let you pick your, your color, and then you can talk people with these. <laughs> Dear Lord, Dear thank you for your Holy Spirit that fills us. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, we got blue. It'll match your shirt. That's cool. Which one do you want? We've got My shirt's actually gold. Black. All right, awesome. My shirt's actually black. It's black. You're right. It is black. <gasps> My finger yeah. can get in here. No, mine can. Well, yours can get in here. Not mine. <laughs> Thanks for coming up here, you guys. Our sermon text this morning is the gospel reading from John's account of Jesus' life out of reverence for the words of Jesus. I invite you to stand for the reading of the gospel. In this reading, John tells us that during a previous Jewish festival prior to Pentecost, Jesus had promised that he would send the Spirit to quench the soul thirst of all believers. On the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood up and said in a loud voice, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. By this, he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. This is the word of the Lord. I invite you all to be seated. I invite you to be seated, Earl. So where can we go when we are spiritually parched? I mean, if you're physically parched, you just have to go camping on Memorial Day weekend, right? And it's bound to rain. Now you'll have more water than you want. But what if you're spiritually parched? What if your soul is dry? This happens, you know, even to believers, and maybe especially to believers, because we believe in serving God and serving God and serving God and putting others first, and sometimes we just use up all of the spirit within us. And in our text for today, Jesus calls out to us and says, come to me, come to me to quench your thirst. And I want to put this word of Jesus in context 
So you understand, because you're just reading through it the first time, it doesn't have the impact I think it actually had in the event. So bear with me for a moment. There were three harvest festivals uh, in Judaism that were commanded by God in the Hebrew scriptures. And, and the first one was first fruits, which was the celebration of the barley harvest, which was the first grain harvest to happen. And that first fruits actually was the day on which Jesus rose from the dead. We don't often mention that, but Jesus rose from the dead on the first fruits harvest day. This is why Paul, in his, uh, in his letters, uh, actually makes reference to this, although we kind of go right past it, and says Jesus is the first fruits of those who are raised from the dead. Right? It's almost a time. The second harvest festival occurred seven weeks after first fruits. So whenever first fruits occurred, the second harvest occurred seven weeks later, and, and it was called, uh, actually, Shabbat in, in Hebrew, but the nickname was the Week of Weeks, or the Festival of Weeks, because it was seven weeks, which is a week of weeks, after the first fruits. Uh, and in Greek, the name of it was Pentecost, which meant 50 days, because, you know, a week of weeks, and add a day, and it's, it's 50 days. And that's the one we heard about in our reading from Acts for today. People from all over the Jewish world had gathered in Jerusalem because it was a pilgrimage feast. If you could make it, you were supposed to celebrate it in Jerusalem. And then there was a third harvest festival, which was at the end of, of summer, which is when we kind of celebrate harvest, when everything's been brought in. And that festival was, was Sukkot, which we know better as the Festival of Tabernacles, or the Feast of Tabernacles, because it was a week-long festival in which the Jewish people and Orthodox Jews today will still camp out for a week. They'll live in tents, they'll live in temporary shelters, or at least eat their meals in temporary shelters, and they do it to remember all the years that God kept them alive in the desert. And they had to live in tents, they had to live in shelters, and how God provided for them. So at the end of this festival, of tabernacles. It was week long, and on the last day, there was a great assembly in Jerusalem at, at the temple, and the priests would go down to the very lowest point in Jerusalem, which was the Pool of Siloam, at the low point of the old city, and they would take a stone jar and they would fill it with water from the Pool of Siloam, and then they would parade all the way up and up and up to the high point in Jerusalem, which was the temple. And one of the priests would take this stone jar of water and pour it out as a reminder of how in the desert God provided for them. In fact, he even, if you're familiar with those stories, he even brought water out of a rock. So they would pour water out of this stone jar. And for those who believed in the Messiah, it was also a reminder of the words of Isaiah that faith in the Messiah would spread like the waters that cover the earth. And in the middle of that, but everybody's seated so they can see the priest pouring out this water. Jesus stands up and he says, if anybody's thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And I can only imagine the shockwaves that went through the people that were at that festival. And Jesus wasn't talking about physical thirst. He was, of course, talking about spiritual thirst, towards which these object lessons from Israel's history pointed. In effect, he says a couple things. The first one is this, recognize your thirst. It's okay to recognize that you're thirsty for something. Now, years ago, there was a, a band called U2, if you're familiar with them, and uh, they were kind of criticized because three of the four members claimed to be Christians, but they wrote a song called, I Still Haven't Found What I'm Looking For. But I think it's a very honest song. You know, it acknowledges that Jesus died for us, but we're still thirsty. We're still hungry because we haven't experienced everything that he has won for us. Jesus says, recognize your thirst. And then he says, if, if anyone's thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Because we all have those thirsty hearts. We all long to be loved unconditionally, to be known for who we really are. We all long for forgiveness and, and, and a complete wiping away of the ways in which we've failed. We all long 
for a day when we are cured of all physical and emotional and mental illnesses. We all long for meaningful, joyful lives that continue on, that don't end, that continue on in a new life. I have to tell you, yesterday um, I was thinking, it's Memorial Day weekend, I should call my mom and dad. And then I realized, nope, I'm only going to be able to call my mom. Right? But you know, when, when grief hits us like that, you know, the world says, oh, it's just the circle of life. And I say, baloney. It's the longing of our hearts for something better. It's what Ecclesiastes says when, when it says that God has set eternity in our hearts. We long for life that doesn't end. We long to be reunited with our loved ones. We long for the supernatural. Any of you are C.S. Lewis fans might have read his book. It's kind of a memoir called Surprised by Joy. And in it, C.S. Lewis talks about how he went from being an atheist to being a deist. It's not his whole spiritual journey. But it is interesting uh, because in addition to people who were Christians who helped guide him, among which were J.R.R. Tolkien, by the way. In addition to that, he had a unique way of coming to belief in God. And that was that he reasoned as an academic. You know, we have thirst because there's such a thing as water, and our bodies need it. If there weren't such a thing as water, then we probably wouldn't thirst. We have hunger because there's such a thing as food, and our bodies need it. We have lust because there's such a thing as sexual reproduction. And to carry on humanity, we need that. And yet we also, almost universally, have a desire for eternity and a desire for the supernatural. And he reasoned that if we have that desire, there must be a heaven and there must be a God. See, recognizing our thirst, recognizing that, you know, Saying everything's perfect and everything's absolutely fantastic is, is actually leading us away from God is important. Jesus gives us permission that when people ask how we are, and we actually think they want to know, to say, I'm not okay. I'm not okay, but that's okay. That's okay. Recognize your thirst so that you can resolve it. But how do you do that? Well, you rely on Christ. Jesus says, whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said. Because, you know, physical thirst can only really be resolved by water. I've been on long hiking trips, you know, where we had to kind of plan our route so we could replenish our water. We, we weren't going to be able to carry that much water with us. And along the way, I remember one where I found some lemongrass. You know, you chew on lemongrass and it helps keep your, your mouth hydrated at least because, you know, it keeps the saliva flowing. I've had friends who've used pebbles. They'll find a clean pebble and put it in there. You know, that just disguises your thirst though. It doesn't change the fact that what you really need is water. It just takes your mind off of it. And a lot of the things that people substitute for Jesus in our world do just that. They just disguise the need. Right? They don't actually satisfy. We can focus our life on entertainment. We, we have more than any group of people ever in the history of the world had. We can focus our lives on excitement, maybe, maybe on extreme sports or, or something else like that. We can focus our lives on money or materialism. We can focus our lives on religion or, or self-righteousness. And it's not going to cure our need. So call focus our lives on Jesus, on what our souls really need, which is forgiveness. The forgiveness that Jesus won when he took our place on the cross so that we could take his place in God's good grace. We focus on Jesus who rose from the dead for our benefit, not for his. He could have snuck back up into heaven. He rose from the dead so that we would live as hope, so that we would know this new life that we're called to. And he poured out his spirit on Pentecost for us, so that we would know this. There's a French mathematician and, and philosopher you may have heard of, Blaise Pascal, and he wrote once that there is a, a God-shaped void in the heart of every person that can be filled by no created thing, but only by the creator himself made known to us through Jesus Christ. This is 
this is what we believe. That if you want to know God, and you want to know what your soul is thirsting for, you go through Jesus. You focus on him. He was God's solution. And this salvation he won has not been culminated yet. We're in the now and the not yet. We know about it now, but we have not yet experienced it. You know, it's like the down payment has been made. Actually, the whole bill has been paid, but we, we haven't gotten to the restaurant yet. Hey, okay? This is what we believe. And in the meantime, to quench our thirst, he calls us to receive the Spirit, his Spirit. He says, whoever believes in me, as the scriptures have said, streams of living water will flow from within him. And John explains, he said, by this, he meant the Spirit, who had not yet, at this time, been poured out on believers. So we need to talk a little bit about what that Spirit is. As I mentioned to the kids, the, the word for Spirit, both in the Greek New Testament is pneumos, which also can mean breath or wind, and then the, the Hebrew Old Testament is ruach, which can mean uh, breath or wind, and that's one image of this mysterious Spirit. We know from Scripture that, that the Spirit is equal to God the Father and, and God the Son, and that the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, and it's no coincidence that next week happens to be a Holy Trinity Sunday. Because that raises a lot of questions. So in the church here, next week is the one week that we actually focus on a particular teaching of the, of, the, of the church, which is the Trinity. Where is that found in the Bible, and what all does that mean, at least to the extent that we can understand it? But we know this, this, this spirit was there and part of creation. And sometimes people say, well, God, the Father, the Creator, God, the Son, the Redeemer, God, the Spirit, the Sustainer. No, 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 that's heresy. They all three were involved in all three things. Okay? And you just read the first couple sentences in Genesis, and the Spirit was there, hovering over the waters. The Spirit was involved in creation. Jesus was involved in creation. That's not the difference. Again, tune in next week. <laughs> but we know that this Spirit is the person of God that inspired people. That's what the word inspired means, right? Breathed into. And so those elders of Israel that we heard about in the Old Testament reading, it was the Holy Spirit that came upon them, and they were able to speak for God. And Moses said, oh, I wish all the people had this spirit. And God said, yeah, it'll happen someday. The Holy Spirit breathed into the prophets, breathed into occasionally priests and kings, but it wasn't poured out on all people until the day of Pentecost. That's what everybody was waiting for. The Holy Spirit convicts us. If you follow this Pentecost story and go on from the, the section that we read, you discover that Peter stands up and he gives this, this long, amazing description of what Jesus has done, and it causes people to be convicted because a lot of those Jewish people had been there in Jerusalem when Jesus the Messiah, was executed. And, and they're, they're torn. They say, brothers, what do we do? And Jesus and Peter says, well, repent, turn around, and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The gift of the Holy Spirit, which will assure you that your sins are forgiven, which will strengthen your faith. And we, we believe that this gift sometimes comes on us in baptism, right? That, that's why we baptize infants, for, for a couple of reasons. One is because we believe that faith is not essentially head knowledge. If so, I'm not smart enough to be saved, right? We can't actually intellectually know God enough. And we believe that faith is essentially trust. Can, can little babies trust? Well, my kids trusted me more as babies than they do now. And do little babies need Forgiveness? I, I mean, maybe not until you can act, they can actually express themselves, but I, I guarantee you that as soon as they can express yourself, you're going to discover, oh yeah, they were born in sin, right? Just like the scripture says, right? It, from the womb, as David puts it, uh, you know, I was sinful and I needed God's forgiveness. From the womb. Hey? But here's the thing. We can reject the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit is given to us, we also need to feed it. We baptize infants in the expectation that they will be raised in the Christian faith. In the expectation that they will be discipled. Right? Because otherwise, it's like 
It's like a pilot light in your furnace, right? It does you no good if you don't turn on the thermostat, turn on the fuel, right? And eventually it's, it's going to go out. It needs to be fed. We believe that God's Spirit preserved the Scripture and speak to us through the Scripture so that the Holy Spirit can do its work of maturing us, of enabling us to serve God. The Holy Spirit even gives us special gifts so that we can serve God. That's part of what the Spirit does. It creates faith. It makes us holy. It keeps unholy spirits out of us because if your heart is just void, right, even if you've repented, I guarantee you, other unholy spirits are going to come and start oppressing you. Unless you have the Holy Spirit of God defending you, right? That, that's one of the things that Jesus says. And this Holy Spirit brings us love and joy and peace when we ourselves have run out of reasons to love and to have joy and to have peace. It's the Spirit of God that speaks to us. And Peter tells us on Pentecost this spirit was poured out in fulfillment of, of the prophet Joel's prediction. So, he says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, do you have to be baptized to receive the Holy Spirit? Well, no. Actually, if you read on in Acts, Peter comes across a group of, of Gentiles who want to know about Jesus. So, he, he travels to Caesarea, and he tells them about Jesus, and they all start manifesting gifts of the Spirit. And he wasn't really prepared for that. He thought, really, the Spirit should only be given to Jewish people. And, uh, but he says, well, I guess they got the Holy Spirit. I, I guess we got to baptize them now. Okay. I guess we got to welcome them into the family of God, because after all, it's God's doing that we are united. And it comes about through the Word and through the Spirit, just like a, a flame and like fuel, which I was remembering this week kind of reminds me of when I was growing up, uh, once my dad had trimmed, we had these huge bushes all around our, our backyard, and he had trimmed them up and made this big burn pile in the alley behind our house. And he took a, a can of, of white gas, of Coleman fuel, and he poured it on this burn pile, and then he went back in the house to get something to light it with. Well, my older brother, who had helped him trim the bushes, came out, saw the can of white gas there, poured some on the fire, and went back inside so that he could get something to light it. My dad came out and thought, you know, I'll bet it's all evaporated by now. So he took more white gas and poured it on the burn pile, and then he lit a match and whoosh! I'll bet that flame was 30 feet high. It singed the telephone lines, it singed my dad's eyebrows, neighbors two blocks away were probably talking about it. This combination of the spirit and a fuel is meant to cause an explosion, and that's what happened on the day of Pentecost. The church exploded. It went from, last week in our readings, we talked about we had 120 believers, to over 3,000 in one day, and they were only counting the men, right? The church exploded, as it was meant to do, because the Holy Spirit was poured out, and these followers of Jesus, they had his word, right? He'd spent three years teaching them, but now they had the Spirit, too. Now they had the spark that changed the world so that this message was handed down to us. And you know, maybe this, this image of, a, of an explosion doesn't really seem plausible on a day that's so rainy like today, but think of it this way. Think of a dam this time of year. All the snow melt, all the flood water behind it. And imagine you can't open the sluices, right? All that pressure building up. And then you open the gates, and what happens? Power! It generates power, and that's what the Holy Spirit of God does. It generates power in our lives. That's why God poured it out. And it's meant to not only quench us, but drench us, to overflow out of us, right? That's why Jesus says streams of living water will flow from within him. They're meant not just to supply us, but to flow out into our lives, into our actions, into the lives of other people. You know, if you're familiar with uh, surviving in the wilderness, you might know one of the myths is that, you know, if you're low on water and you anticipate not having enough water, you should ration it, right? Well, no, you shouldn't, actually. Because you'll get farther if you keep yourself hydrated, even if it means using up your water faster, right? Because once your body gets dehydrated, it's going to start shutting down. So 
drink the water to the extent your body needs it and use that energy to go find new water. And it's that way with the Holy Spirit of God. And sometimes in the church, I think we're afraid of God's Spirit because it might cause God to be in control and not us. Right? And we become drips. You know, we restrict the flow of the Holy Spirit because we're afraid. Right? Or we store up the Holy Spirit, you know, just in case we need a fire extinguisher or, you know, in case we start running out of water, we'll rely on the Holy Spirit. But God calls us to let His Spirit flow from within us into the lives of other people and not be afraid. And that is the message of Pentecost, that we are gifted with the Holy Spirit so that we can serve God, so that his church can grow. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you now to stand up as we uh, confess our faith along with believers throughout the world and throughout the generations. We do it in the words of the Apostles' Creed this morning, which includes, as all the creeds do, this section at the end about the work of the Holy Spirit. So we speak to one another and we say, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We join our hearts together in prayer. Heavenly Father, you know when we are running on empty, trying to do your work under our own steam, but feeling parched inside. Replenish our faith and refill us with your spirit so that we may continue to know the joy of your salvation and overflow with hope that spills over into the lives of others. Lord, in your mercy. If there's any way in which we are hindering the work of your Spirit through sinful attitudes or behaviors, we repent, Lord, asking that you would convict us and enable us to repent. Revive your church in our day and guide our efforts to grow your kingdom in our community and throughout the world. Protect all those threatened, persecuted, or imprisoned for serving you. Lord, in your mercy. Guard our families and friends from all harm of body and spirit. Heal those struggling with physical or mental illness. Give courage to those struggling with grief or addictions. And defend those who are viciously and unfairly attacked. Guide and preserve those who protect and serve our communities in medical, military, government, and emergency services. Lord, in your mercy. Because you have promised to hear us, we pray for the following people in situations in need of your love, healing, and power. Intervene according to your goodness, Lord, in your mercy. Together we pray for your will to be done. In the words of Jesus, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Receive now the blessing of the Lord from the end of Paul's letter to the Christians in Rome. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to stay standing for our closing hymn. It's, it's a prayer, really, hymn of the Holy Spirit. Thank you.
for some announcements. And anyone who has announcements to come